Thank you. Um, so finally, we arrive at um, what I had promised, which is we're starting. We're going to start. We're going to linearize this theory. Uh, so what does it mean linearize? So just the, the model we have in mind. is that given a group G and and a ring K okay. we can study not just G actions on sets but G actions on K modules but to the cleanest way of studying G, uh, G actions on K module is to first study the group ring. And then once you've studied the group ring, um, you really want to consider not in practice, at least the thing that's most analogous to what we want to do is not just its category of representation, but its derived category. of uh, modules and we, and we won't have time to go much into the, the formal definitions but the basic point of the derived category we will study complexes of K of G modules Um, in the same, in the sense of chain complexes, with the specific notion of equivalence not being not isomorphism but quasi-isomorphism, with um, maps inducing isomorphism on homology as the equivalences. Okay, so that's that's the model we want to do. Except we want to do it with G, um, you know, not a group, but one of these loop spaces that we've been thinking about, and K, not a ring, but one of these uh, ring spectra that were mentioned yesterday. So we're not going to do much on the K side. So on on the side of you know classical algebra, the kind of universal ring that you could work over is the integers. On the stable, on the, you know, on the homotopy side, the universal ring is the sphere, and really what I mean is the sphere spectrum. So the first question you should ask is why did I have to pass the spectra? Well, that's for the following basic reason. If we're going to be doing some linear theory is that we need to be able to make sure that our spaces of morphisms have some notion of addition. Okay. 
So what's addition? Addition is a binary operation, which is commutative and associative. And we know that uh, for topological spaces, that's just not the case. Space of maps from X to Y has no such structure. But let us suspend once. In fact, it's enough to suspend x, but you'll see in a second that if we suspend x and just x, then we're not going to get the right, we're not going to get a meaningful answer. Uh, if we suspend, I'll, I'll just first suspend x and then tell you what happens. If we suspend x, then we have the map. So what is suspend? Suspend means basically you take the product with S1. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, should, I should not assume that you know what suspend means. Well, I, although there, there was a lecture on this. But suspend x, um, sigma x, that's the notion for suspension. Um, there is a problem always with um, whether we do base topological spaces or unbased topological spaces. I'm going to just stick with base topological spaces, and when I do the suspension, I will add a base point. Okay. So this means um, S1 crossed with S for X union a base point modulo, uh, where you, you collapse the base point on X. So you collapse. Uh, base point on X, so on S1, so 1 cross X is identified with um, S1 cross star. Okay, so, so we have the map that goes from sigma X to sigma X wedge sigma X. And here, what I mean is, so this thing, this sigma X comes with the canonical base point which is 1 and star. And this wedge means that you take these two spaces and you glue them together along the base point. So they glue the disjoint union. Along base point. So we have this map that just comes from the pinch map that we used earlier. So if you are given this map, um, then we can define an addition, well, actually, it's just a product. <laughs> By precomposing with this pinch map. If you think through what is needed in order to um, um, 
in order, so, sorry, so this is product. So now you'd like to prove this product is associative, but as before, it is not associative, it's only associative up to homotopy. But that's okay. Because when we are trying, when we try to, you know, ch change our notions from usual algebra to topology, we should not necessarily require that these things be commutative and associative on the nose, as we saw that was not always a good idea, and it doesn't give us the necessary flexibility. We should assume that we have commutative, commutativity and associativity up to all, all possible reasonable homotopies, up to. A uh, tower, and I don't want to be precise here, of coherent homotopies. Or really with a tower of coherent homotopies. And then here you can make this coherent. Okay, so this looks fine. I could just take x and I could suspend it and then I could do that. But you note know that if you did this, if you only suspend one side, then this is not going to be a good notion because for example, there's not going to be an identity. Okay, to get a good notion. I.e. an identity. We should really suspend both sides. And that's a good thing because once we suspend both sides, there is a natural map from the space of maps from x to y to the space of maps from the suspension of x to the suspension of y. which is basically take the product with S1. So then the question becomes, can we stop here? Can we just say we suspend once and we look at spaces which are suspensions? Um, and if you do, you will realize that this is not, it is not commutative. Okay? You don't have a commutative product. And you can detect this, detect uh, at a very basic level, you can detect it at the level of homotopy groups. Okay. So, how can we fix this? Amazingly enough, the answer is suspend again. So the, you know, the failure of the, the map to be, uh, the, the product to be commutative just comes down from the, to the fact that if you take this map and you pinch and then you swap these two factors, that's not homotopic to just pinching once. Geometrically. This comes from the failure of the uh, diagram S1, S1, wedge S1. This is just pinch. This is pinch. S1, wedge S1. And this is swap factors. We just call it transposition. Failure of this diagram to commute even up to homotopy. Hmm. 
<clears throat> okay? But if you do the same thing with S2, it's not a problem. We do have a homotopy or the corresponding diagram. And I, you know, if you've never seen this before, uh, I really suggest you, you try to kind of work it out for yourself. If you take S2 and you, what is, the, what is collapsing into? You pick a, like a great circle somehow on S2, you collapse that, you get two circles. You get, sorry, you get two, S, two copies of S2. I mean, the picture is exactly the same. Okay, and then you ask, is this diagram, so now you swap these two, is that homotopic to the identity? Uh, and the answer is yes, and the proof is you take this circle and you just, this S2 and you just rotate it by 180 degrees before you start. Okay, and that's something you cannot do here. <laughs> You cannot take this S1 and say, I'm going to take this S1 and rotate it. It means somehow you can, you can only do that in an ambient space. You can't do it in, the, in, in S1 itself, but in here you can do it for S2, and that's the proof, but you should, you should really make that, try to make that precise. So, sorry, what? Yeah, but you cannot move the base point. Right, you have to keep the base point fixed. That's right, good, good. That's a very good observation. And here you can do it keeping this base point fixed. Okay, so that shows the way ahead. So take suspension one more time. Okay, and then you can ask, are we done yet? Why, you know, now if you look at things, you'll realize that the, if you look at homotopy groups, you'll realize we have a unit, we have a product on homotopy groups, the product, is, uh, the composition, composition is associative, addition, yeah. So on homotopy groups, we have, you know, a commutative product. So, are we done? And the answer is no, we are not done. And the reason we are not done is because the, um, is because I said that I don't want it to just be associative, I want it to be associative on the, no, on, up to some kind of higher, high, up to some tower of coherent homotopies. Oh, sorry, commutative. So, the problem is, is that our proof of um, commutativity relies on this chain. Okay? of S2. Okay, so I could take my S2 and I could rotate it this way. But I could also take my S2 and I could rotate it the other way. Okay. So in fact, there are two choices. So this is now again a phenomenon that is that only arises once you start th thinking about topology, which is sometimes it's not enough to just make sure that um, you, you, know, you have a structure. You need to make sure that the choices that lead to that, st that structure are themselves well controlled. And in this case, it's not well controlled because this, these two possible choices do not form a contractible set. A contractible set. Okay. 
But if we suspend one more time, then instead of two choices, we will get an S1 of choices. And that's better, okay? Because two choices has pi zero, that's not zero, but, but well, it's non-trivial, but um, S1 has only pi one that's non-trivial. So let's suspend one more time. Well, that's still look not okay. But then if you continue suspending, then the connectivity and here connectivity means the first non-trivial homotopy group of the space of choices. goes to infinity. And that's the justification for defining the stable category um, to have, well, it has many objects, but the objects that we will care the most about as sum of its objects. The suspension spectra of spaces, okay, which means, which are just the collection of spaces Well, there is a first space, x, sigma x, sigma 2x, and so on, okay? And morphisms, so let, let me, like, this is just this collection is called sigma infinity. And uh, I, I decided to be sloppy with the base point, so sometimes you would put like a plus somewhere. I'm just, I think it's not really worth it. Um, sigma infinity x um, with morphisms f x y so <laughs> so here there's like a there's a delicate point but I'll, I'll just do it anyway by the collection of spaces okay so so the first space is going to be co-limit over n of the space of maps from sigma n of x to sigma n of y so this is the most important thing this is what i was writing over here First, take maps, and then you map it into maps of suspended spaces. Map it to suspended twice. Um, but then, just because um, I'll, I'll just say something in a second. Map of sigma n x, sigma n plus one y, etc. Okay. So what just happened? So what I did is, I, I, did, I did two things at once. First, I said, I want to define a new category called spectra. I'm not going to define all the objects, but some of its objects are just, but that category of spectra, what we did is form a category, let's call it SP, with a functor. spectra from topological spaces 
to SP. Okay? But not only did I do this, I also made the morphisms in SP spectra themselves. So that morphisms in SP are also so spectra. That's what this definition is. But if you take a spectrum, you can always just ignore all the rest of the data and focus on this first part. So you can, well, if you're careful, um, you can get a space from a spectrum. That's this. So in uh, yesterday's talk, this was called the loop. Inf this is this is the sigma infinity functor. There's also a functor the other way, called loop infinity. Sorry. Topological spaces. Or some good enough model for topological spaces. But let's just say topological spaces here. Uh, from SP to top. And in our case, um, what I mostly care about is that, roughly speaking, if you try to evaluate it on this spectrum of functions from X to Y, you recover this co limit. On. Um, map sigma and x. Okay, just to make sure uh, it's clear what I mean when I say co limit. I just mean the increasing union of these spaces. And of course, when you say you recover, you really, in practice, you recover a space that is homotopy equivalent to this. Okay. So, so far, um, the only real feature of spectra that we have used is that, you know, and once you pass to this limit, you have this nice addition on the space of maps, and that nice addition is, you know, has all the desired homotopies for its uh, associativity and its commutativity. But there are some essential features that I just want to mention. Um, <clears throat> of this category that make it very much like the category of representation of a uh, the derived category of representations of a ring and that for me that just means some kind of category of chain complexes the first one is that there is a shift functor So the shift functor on chain complexes is you take your chain complex and you say what used to be in degree i is now in degree i minus one. Okay? In spectra, it just is given by suspension. Instead of having this sequence, which is x, sigma x, sigma squared x, so on and so forth, I can just shift by taking sigma x and moving it up by one. So sigma of sigma infinity x equals, well, just the expected thing. Sigma x, sigma squared x, and so on. Well, you can tell me topological spaces already had this shift functor. But now, this shift functor is invertible. Okay. 
And that was not the case in spaces. How is it invertible? If I want to write down sigma inverse of sigma infinity x. Well, that's not going to be a suspension spectrum anymore. Okay? There's not going to be a space that gives rise to sigma inverse. Well, it will be, but not directly via that construction. You usually set this to be just a point. Okay? That's zero. And then you start x not at the zero at the first coordinate, but at the second one. This should really be the zeroth one. But sigma x. So Actually, the way I did it is the empty set, but um, that would be really, well, that would be the honest truth. So I don't want to do it. I'm going to do a point. Um, okay. So, so then you could say, well, wait a minute. When I was writing down these um, suspension spectra, it's clear that this one and this one is the suspension of this one and this one is the suspension of this one. But, and, and the first one, that's not true anymore. But I just said these are some of the objects. Okay? In general, all you require is that you have a collection of spaces and let's say that there is a map from a suspension of one to the next. We don't need... that the kth space is a suspension of uh, the k minus first. Rather, we just need a map. Okay. So that is the first feature. And now the second feature has to do with the um, relationship between the, sigma, the suspension functor and the loop functor. So on spaces, we have an adjunction. that says that the maps from sigma x to y are equivalent to the maps from x to the loops on y. That's just a formality. In spectra, we have a natural equivalence. So you can just take loops y and, well, we have natural equivalents, uh, and, and you can apply it kind of level-wise here, okay? And if you think very carefully, you can't quite swap the two things, sigma and loop, but you can use that adjunction to create a new spectrum um, in which you, you, you know, the spaces are basically the suspension spectra of the, the suspensions of the loop space, of the one copy of the loop space. Uh, anyway, we have a natural equivalence between sigma inverse and loop. Okay. And this natural equivalence arises because of the Freudenthal suspension. Once you have these two ingredients, uh, and together with what I said earlier, which is things being additive, you know, up to coherent um, and somehow all possible homotopies and, and commutative, you have most of the ingredients that are needed to deal with spectra. So, th th this I will say. Sorry. Yeah, so what I sh really should have done is I should have talked to, with based, I should have used based space. Yes, this is a point. Okay. What Sorry, can you just repeat that? Yeah. Uh, sigma inverse. Okay, so the, so the thing is that the, no the notation is slightly uh, bad. So, so sigma here denotes both the functor from topological spaces to topological spaces, 
and the functor from spectra to spectra. So there's a functor from spectra to spectra called sigma. Okay. And now, ah, so you're saying, what if I apply sigma to sigma inverse? Is that what you're asking me? Yes, I won't get the same space back. Okay. But if you look at it past the first entry, Um, no, I will, yes, yes, that's right. If I apply sigma inverse to sigma, I will get star, sigma x, sigma squared x, so on and so forth. That's not the same as sigma infinity, but after the first entry, it becomes the same. And the morphisms in this category is defined by this co-limit. So it doesn't see the stuff at the beginning. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion. Okay, so these, these are the essential features that one should be aware of. Yeah. Oh, this is just end. There's a D missing. <laughs> and the loops. The loops and this and the loops act as the inverse of suspension. And this is non-trivial because it, this is somehow the starting point of the subject. This is about Freudenthal suspension. This is about map um, between, so this says that you always have a map between to um, the um, loops on the suspension of X. Okay, you always have a map this way. And you know, if X is like a point, this doesn't say much. But if X is highly connected, then this map is highly connected. Okay. So this is 2N, approximately, I never get the numbers right, 2N connected if X is approximately N connected. And again, connectivity is just the measure of when, when the first non-trivial homotopy group um, appears. And in this, in, for a map, it's when the first non-trivial homotopy group is different. Okay? Yes. That's right. That's right. And in fact, you should, you know, yes, that's absolutely right. And then somehow the way I'm doing it, there isn't even a natural isomorphism. It just, I'm just saying there is, an, there, there, there is an equivalence. You shouldn't say isomorphism, you just say equivalence. There is, there is a natural equivalence between the two results. Omega infinity, okay, this is a little bit hard. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to define it because to define it, it takes a lot of work. So, um, to, to define omega infinity, the best thing to do actually is to first talk about not suspensions. So, you take these suspension spectra, okay, and then you want to replace them by but, but, but what I call um, uh, omega spectra. So, what are omega spectra? They're spectra with the property that this map. Okay, you don't, well, if, if you suspend, you don't want that to be an isomorphism, but you want, you want an ad, a homeo, homotopy equivalence, you want it adjoint to be a homotopy equivalence. Okay, but when you do that, this space is going to change enormously. Okay, like you're going to replace this, this x by some kind of, okay, well, sorry, I did not intend to do this, but I think it's, if, um, let's just do this. So, to define, uh, you can define loop infinity. But so of course it doesn't, whatever I would have said wouldn't have made sense because you need Freudenthal suspension to make sense of it. You can define uh, loop infinity of uh, sigma infinity of x. This is the only case that, I, that I'm going to care about, okay? As the co-limit n of loop n sigma n x. Okay, so what are the maps in my colimit? This map, done iteratively. Okay, so what? Why is this a good thing? Because as mentioned, well, yesterday. So this is. The, the, I'm kind of trying to use some of um, the talk, the like, the content from the lecture yesterday. This is an infinite loop space. So this is, well, of course, this is a lie. This is not an infinite loop space. This has all the desired features of being an infinite loop space. Okay. To really make it an infinite loop space, you have to control these maps a lot. But this is 
you, you should think of it as an infinite loop space. Because if you stop at any n, you get an n-fold loop space, and you take a union of all of them. If you see this thing the first time, you think this is crazy because you know, the, the, um, you know, you're doing things more and more and letting n go larger and larger, things are going up to infinity. But they're not. The operations sigma and loop are like being, are almost inverse. Right? Eventually they become inverse to each other. So you, you go up n times and you go back down n times. But the way you go back and up, up and down, they aren't the identity on homotopy groups. They're only the identity on homotopy groups up to degree 2n. Okay? So, you know, this guy is basically well behaved up to degree 2n and it knows about the stable homotopy groups of x. So, any, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's not true. <laughs> sorry. So, anyway, that's... Um, oh, yeah, it does know the stable homotopy groups. So, th that's, the, that's this picture. Uh, so, this is the infinite loop space and, and that's loop infinity. More generally, you have to do something else. Okay. So, so now what I'm absolutely not going to do is talk about uh, ring spectra, but I will just say they exist. If you have a much more careful formulation of what it means to be a spectrum, you can make sense not just of a smash product of spectra, but of a smash product of spectra that is associative and that is commutative. So, with much more care, we get a smash product. Smash product just means basically some kind of tensor product. Spectra with desired associativity. and commutativity. Um, so, for a reference, um, I think, the, I think the, the best reference I know is a paper with many authors, um, M May, Mandel, Schwede, and Shipley, called um, Model Categories of Diagram Spectra. So I, I, I will just put it here as a reference and we're not going to use it. But the idea is, of course, what you would expect is that, you know, there is a, an n space here and, uh, you know, an m space and you want to smash them together and land in the m plus n space. And really, the question is how to do this, in some, do this in some kind of coherent way and in a way that actually has applications. So, if you have this, then you can make a notion of, notion of a ring and an associative ring and a commutative ring. And now, finally, I can talk about the sphere spectrum. So, the sphere spectrum is S equals sigma infinity of S0, okay? But it's just a collection of spaces, S0, S1, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this has a smash product. This is a ring. It's in fact associative and commutative. So, if we have a monoid in spaces, a topological monoid, X, okay, we can form we can form the group ring. So this group ring is going to be very strange, I mean, just notation for something which we are, which I've already introduced. This 
this by def this is just sigma infinity. Okay. But to me, this notation highlights um, that you think of this as the process of linearizing um, a, a monoid, a topological monoid, and turning it into some, pl it, putting it somewhere where you can do homological algebra. And the key example for us, yes. What is the product? So by product, so you have to be careful. So there's two products, like in topological spaces. So there's, there's um, I guess I have not stressed this fact. So on topological spaces, there is really only one product, which is just the product. Okay. On based topological spaces, there are two products. There is the product, which is... No, 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 no. It's it's, it's good. Good if you know if you if you're asking the question, then I should answer it. So on uh, topological, but but it's going to take me a sec. So, it's, it's, uh, on base topological spaces, we have one, the product x cross y, which satisfies the 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 universal property. that uh, maps from z to x cross y is maps from z to x cross uh, maps from z to y. OK? So that's one of them. But there is another product. So in, in unbased topological spaces, this product, the product satisfies, what I'm trying to say is that for unbased topological spaces, the product satisfies two properties. And when you pass to spectra, or if you pass to two, uh, or you pass to base topological spaces, it splits into two things. But we also have something called X smash Y. And I used the smash product when I talked about suspension. That's the thing where you collapse the base point, collapse the product with base point. Collapse. Um, base point cross y union x cross base point. And you could ask, what property does this satisfy? And the property that this satisfies is maps from x smash y to z is equivalent to maps from x maps y z. It is adjoint to maps. Okay? So, which product did you want to tell me? Would you want me to tell you about? That's right. Yes, this product. That's right. No, no, but it's not cross. It's smash. Right. So if you did it in abelian groups, you know, if you want to make an abelian group into a ring, you don't write down a map R cross R to R, or rather. The map that you write down is bilinear. You write down a map like this, okay? Tensor product. So you're asking me what is the analog of tensor product for spectra? Okay? And that's the delicate part. That's the thing where what you really want it to be is that. Uh, so the the kind of idea is that you take some kind of x n and you do y m. Okay, and this will be the n plus m space of x smash y. Okay, but if you do this, it doesn't make any sense because there are many of these showing up here. Okay, so you have to somehow glue them together, and that's what I, that's why that's why it becomes a mess. Okay. So, where was I? Oh yeah, this was that, this thing. Okay, good. So we have that, uh, so we're going to just use the notation. Um, uh, 
the notation of this kind of group ring as uh, for the suspension whenever x is this monoid, or more generally whenever it has this kind of A-infinity structure. And so this leads to the following question. What is the category of modules over the group ring, not of a random topological monoid, but, well, we know that basically all group-like topological monoids are equivalent to loop spaces, the loop space of the space. Okay. So we knew that if you took just the loop space itself and you look at topological, that's what I ended with last time. If you look, take the loop space and if you look at um, modules, like this topological spaces with an action of the loop space, then you can think of those as fibers of a fibration over B. So in the so the different so in, 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 in topological spaces, I'm gonna start using in the unstable case. I.e. for in top. The answer is um, that modules correspond to uh, vibra vibrations over B. Okay. In the stable world, we can't quite say vibrations, okay, but we can do the next best thing. So theorem, this is due to May and Sigurdsson in the kind of strength that we need it. There is an equivalence between S omega B modules and the category <coughs> of exactly what you would expect in some sense, except the name is not vibration. You could say vibrations of spectra, but the, 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 the terminology is parametrized. Parametrized. Spectra over B. Okay? So I will not, I mean, there is no way that I can give, given that I have not given a complete definition even of what are spectra, I cannot give a definition of what are parametrized spectra. But I can do, what I can do is do the same thing that I did um, for spectra, which is suggest what happens if you look only at suspension spectra. It turns out that the theory is, you know, it would be ideal to work with um, suspensions of vibrations, but suspending, you know, that requires some, quite a lot of technicalities. Um, but I, I guess we're not. So the basic idea is to consider vibrations, or maybe if you really want to be extremely careful, just fiber bundles um, over, uh, sorry. Again, this is not the basic idea for all sp parameter spectra, but for the ones that are easiest to access. Um, analog of suspension spectra. Okay, so, uh, so the analog of suspension spectra, the basic idea for them is to consider fiber bundles over um, B, okay? Or vibrations over B. And if I take this vibration, I want a notion of suspending this vibration so that I get another vibration over B. This is the suspended vibration. So what is this suspended vibration? You don't want to just take this whole space and suspend it. Because if you did it, there would not be a map to B left. Okay? What you want to do is simply suspend all the fibers.
Okay? That's what you do. So to, you know, then you have to figure out some formalism. I mean, you don't want to just suspend the fibers one by one. You just want to, some construction that takes E and produces some space that maps over B so that all the, fiber, all the fibers of the new space are just the suspensions of the fibers of the old space. And this is not very hard to, um, to work with. OK? Well, what's, I mean, a fiber, yes, any fibration. Does it need to be ceramic? Well, so if you really want to work in the, in the Macy Gertzen, so there are many. So in the Macy Gertzen setting, they basically start with any fibration and then say, say well, then we want to talk about which ones are going to give us cofibrant objects and which ones are fibrant with respect to what model structure. There's tons and tons of choices for what to do here. Um, so the thing is that, yeah, usually in this kind of language, what you do is you just define some categories, usually very large. If you try to compute morphisms between two objects there, it doesn't necessarily give you the correct answer. You may have to change one of them by some procedure. And so that's, I mean, in some sense, you could even say you just take topological spaces over B and do this construction. That'd be nightmarish because you have a fibrant replacement functor. Something that replaces every map over B by a vibration by not changing this. So you could do that. I mean, that's not what they do, but it's not, it's not unreasonable. But that's, um, and now, uh, remember I already introduced before, so in this unstable case, we have maps over B of vibrations, okay? and that's what corresponded to maps of modules over the loop space. And then st stably, when you pass to spectra, you just do the naive thing. You just say, you take the co-limit from this to the next one where you suspend over B once and suspend over B again and again and again. So we have maps, suspension maps, suspension homomorphisms, map over B, E1, E2, to map over B, sigma B, E1, E2, as before. And then you take the co-limit, is, okay, and so here now comes, I mean, I did it already before, I said, if you want to compute maps between suspension spectra, you just take the co-limits of this thing. That's actually a theorem, okay? That's not the definition. Similarly here, if this vibration is sufficiently nice, um, and I think, you know, Sarah is good enough, um, uh, the co-limit is, and then here we, what you do is you say, uh, the co-limit um, is, um, loop infinity of what is called FB, and I have not defined this. Um, uh, so is the first space of the spectrum F over B. So I should write sigma over B, uh, infinity E1 sigma over B, infinity E2, okay? So again, sigma infinity over B is the collection of some, some collection of spaces. Sigma infinity B of E is just the collection of spaces E, sigma B, sig oh, sorry, sigma over B of E, sigma two over B of E, and so on and so forth, and each one of these maps to X. That maps to B. Okay, so just like before, you have a collection of spaces indexed by say integers, natural numbers, and but now instead of being spaces, they all map to B. And if you think very, and if you try to do things carefully, you realize that that's not enough. You know, you need like if you should, should I should be working in the based case, so there needs to be um, not just a map here, but also a section. But I, I didn't. I don't want to talk about the section. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay. So, um, well, that's that's the theorem. I mean, that's the that's the sketch at least of the of the of the meaning of parametrized spectra, at least the ones we care about, the ones that are most likely to arise for us. Uh, the meaning of parametrized spectra, um, and then. Uh, the proof of this macy gerson theorem is up to the technicalities of setting up the category of parametrized spectra is the proof of the theory is just you apply the result that I discussed in the last lecture at every level. So up to technical details. I'm sure, I'm sure May and I don't know if they will agree or not whether it's technical details, but anyway. Technical details. The proof. of Macy Gertson amounts to applying uh, the equivalence in the unstable case at every level. You, you know that if you just talk about loops acting on spaces, then you get vibrations. And here we basically have just a sequence of vibrations. So a map from this spectrum to, the, to this, this parametrized spectrum to another parametrized spectrum is going to be a collection of maps on each one of these that are appropriately compatible. So you, stick, you fix one of them, and then you compare it to the corresponding maps of modules, and then you take some appropriate limits and make sure that everything behaves, behaves as you expect. Okay, so shall we go 20 minutes. So once you have this, <clears throat> once you have this uh, notion of uh, parametrized spectra, you could, uh, you could now ask for methods of computing it. So the spectrum F, B, so now I'm going to write just E1, E2, okay, where E1, E2 are parametrized spectra. Can be computed using different methods, just like You should think of this as something, again, we've linearized. It's like we've passed to homology. I'm saying you can compute homology or even homotopy groups using different methods. If you like simplicial techniques, you can compute homotopy groups using simplicial techniques. You could take the associated con complex and then do some construction entirely um, you know, in the simplicial world. The one that I want to focus on is Morse theory. And the Morse theory that I want to do is Morse theory on B. And the spectra that I want to focus on are the spectra that actually give rise, that are somehow universal, universal vibration, which means I want to basically recover this ring itself, which means I'd look at the path vibration. where you do Morse on B. And just for concreteness, you could do this in general. But for concreteness, you set, I'm going to just set E1 equals E2 equals the suspension spectrum, again, over B of the path vibration on B. Okay. And the reason that I care about that is because this will give me some kind of more the theoretic model for the product on this ring, on this ring spectrum. Okay? So I will assume some familiarity with Morse theory. So let's just pick, uh, so given a Morse function, Morse 
function. Okay, I'm gonna, we're going to have to assume a lot about the Morse function. We might as well just do it now. Morse male function. Uh, F from B to R. Okay. I will just recall that the Morse complex is a direct sum over the critical points of, well, usually of just a copy of the integers or a copy of your ring or something, oh, something like that. Now, what we want to do is we just replace this here by the fiber of this, or more precisely, by the space of maps from this fiber to itself. Instead, we take for each x in this critical locus. Okay. So what I want to do is the function spectrum between the suspension spectrum of the space of pads on B with endpoint on x, and it's So let me just <clears throat> remind you what does Morse male means. So Morse means all the critical points are isolated, okay? So uh, are, are non-degenerate. It means that locally it looks like some xi squared, okay? Morse male is actually not well defined because it relies on an additional choice. You have to have a metric. Morse male means that if you take a critical point here, and you look at the descending manifold, everything that flows down from it. And you take another point here and you look at everything that flows up from it. Okay? And the intersections are transverse. Okay? Actually, it never looks like this. But the intersections are going to be copies of R and the intersections of transverse. Transverse. Intersection of um, ascending and descending manifolds. Ascending. Okay. If you want to see an example of a function that is not more smell, take this torus and put the height function here, like the actual height function on the blackboard. So there's going to be a critical point of index 0, a critical point of index 2, and two critical points of index 1. The index is basically the number of directions where the function goes down. And if you use this function, you see that the descending manifold of this, of this one here is this S1, and the ascending manifold of this other critical point in the next one is this other S1, and these two S1s don't intersect transversely. Okay, so that's not good. But if you tilt things, generically, if you just tilt things, then what's going to happen is that that's not the case anymore. The flow lines are going to do something like this. Okay, so that's that's the, so this is a kind of genericity condition, and to be completely precise, it's not enough to have a Morse function. You have to have a. Oh, I didn't say this. I'm sorry. Yes, we're doing Morse theory. Therefore, B is a Riemannian manifold. Okay. Morse theoretic plus or B, you know, B Riemannian manifold. So, um, okay, good. So, what is this? 
this spectrum, FB from E1 to E2, it's basically some kind of fiber-wise maps from uh, the fiber of E1 at B to the fiber of E2 at B. Okay? But you can't just pick one or the other. You have to basically something which is global that fiber-wise restricts to such a map. So this is the, the, some kind of fiber of this space. Okay? So I take the union of all of these. And now the Morse differential is a map from one of these things. Okay, this, is, this is lots and lots of notation. Um, but I will keep it because I think if I, if I try to make it shorter, it's not going to help. From F of sigma infinity PXB, sigma infinity PXB, to F sigma infinity PYB, sigma infinity PYB. And this map has to be associated to every pair X and Y with the property that there is a gradient flow line of the Morse function from X to Y. So having a Morse flow line uh, is usually such that the space of gradient trajectories, I'll define this in a second, T x y is non-empty. Okay. Or rather, I mean, we could define it for all of them, and then if it's empty, you just get the zero map. So what is the space of gradient trajectory? So I said before that we have a, it's that picture over there. So this is the unstable manifold of X intersected with the stable manifold of Y modulo some R translation. I won't repeat the picture, but... This um, well, anyway, this is x. This is y. This unstable manifold of x is basically just a copy of uh, R k, where k is the Morse index. Okay, so okay, and this stable manifold of y is a similar thing, where you get this Morse index of y. If they intersect, so these are the gradient flow lines. If they intersect, they have to, at a point, then because they're both closed under the gradient flow, there is an entire line along which they intersect. So you mod out by this R and you get a space. You get, a, in fact, you get a compact space if you do the appropriate compactification. The more smale assumption is that this is a manifold with, well, corners or boundaries or something like that. implies that this, well, there's some kind of question of compactification. Compactifies, so I'll just do it like that, to a manifold with corners. Great. So it compactifies to a manifold with corners, and, um, and so we're going to use this property, the fact that it's a manifold, to define the desired map. But what I want to do is first, let's consider, first, let's consider the special case, in fact, the first case, where uh, T of x, y, is what we call rigid, i.e. it has dimension zero. So 
So now finally I'm going to use this, um, the fact that we have linearized. Okay, I'm about to say we want to define the map from here to here to be the sum of contributions for each element. for each element of t x y we have a map and in fact we have a map already at the unstable level so let me write it like that from maps um, um, from um, P X B P X B two maps P Y B P Y B. How is this map defined? So here is the way that I like to draw it. So I have my base point here. I have my X and I have my Y. They are critical points. Okay, and I have chosen a gradient flow line between them, okay? So now let us say that I have some map here which takes an arbitrary loop gamma, okay? To, um, sorry, this was a bad choice. Takes, I'll draw another picture. So keep this for now. So this picture I want to draw. So what is the element in here? It's something, it's some phi that takes something here. You apply phi to it, and it gives me another one. Phi of gamma. Okay, that's what I, I just want to stress this part. Okay. So how are we going to use this? Now I'm not, I shouldn't have drawn that. The point is that I shouldn't have drawn the gamma. So to use this, you again draw the same picture that I had just drawn, x, y. Okay. And I have this base point. And I have this flow line. So let's say, so I, want, I have this phi, and I'm going to keep this phi in the back of my mind. So I want in the end to have something which takes every path from the base point to y and gives me another path. So let me take a path. Gamma. I take such a path. Then the first thing that I do is I concatenate it with uh, the gradient trajectory. I concatenate it with the gradient trajectory. So now I have a path from the base point to x. And then, once I do that, I can apply phi. Phi of gamma, which is this gamma here, dot with the gradient flow line. Okay. But then, once I have a path that goes from the base point to x, I can concatenate again with the gradient flow line. Let me just keep it. Dot with gradient flow line. So that, that's the first thing, and then you multiply that. You, you concatenate that with gradient flow. Okay? So you use this gradient flow line twice. First, you use it to go from y to x, so that you can apply this map. And then, once you have that map, it ends at x, and you apply it back to go back the other way. So that's the map. So we have, for each section, you have to map. So by suspending, we get a map at the level of spectra, <clears throat> f of sigma infinity x, no, there's no x, um, p, x, b, sigma, infinity, p, x, b, to the same thing, to the one with the y's. And finally, we just take the sum over all these maps, over all the elements.
So if we were doing ordinary Morse theory with just chain complexes, that would be the end of the story. Okay? We would be counting these things, and then we would sit down and prove that d squared equals zero. But d squared does not, this does not make sense here, d squared does not equal to zero. You really need more maps. You really need the map, as I said above, for every one of these spaces. And that's going to be very hard, certainly impossible, to explain in the remaining four minutes. In fact, the remaining four minutes, I can't even explain what I wanted to explain. So let's consider the next case, which is the case where T of x, y is a closed manifold. i.e. without boundary. Okay. So now I want to use an essential feature of these spaces, which was observed by Frank in the 70s and expanded upon by Cohen, Jones, and Siegel. It's actually, I don't, it's, it's, it's a nice observation. Uh, which is that T of x, y, the tangent has stably trivial tangent bundle. In fact, it has more. It has a canonical stable trivialization of its tangent bundle. So where does this trivialization come from? It comes from This comes from the fact that uh, T of x, y is essentially embedded inside the unstable manifold. We could do the other one, but anyway, unstable manifold of x. Okay? And this is contractible. And the normal bundle is given by the st uh, unstable manifold of Y, which is trivial. I mean, this is not just contractible. This is really a copy of Rn, Rk, uh, by Wk, which is again, uh, which is you can think of it as a by the tangent. Well, I'm going to have to say anyway by which is also trivial. So if you have a base, a manifold you know, embedded in RK with trivial normal bundle, well, that's exactly what this says. Okay? And to say something is canonical just means all I have to do is I have to trivialize the data of this guy, and I have to trivialize this. So we just need, so I should be a little bit more saying by Trevor, but we just need to uh, trivialize the positive and negative um, eigenspaces of the Hessian at x and y. Positive and negative um, eigenspaces of Hessian of f at all cr at critical points. I'm modding by R, yes. Sir. 
Uh, yeah, but it, it, it doesn't because R is also trivial, right? So I said actually, I said it carefully. I didn't say that this was, in fact, yeah, you're right. The normal bundle is not this, it's given by this direct sum R. So good job. So direct sum R, direct sum of the flow line, but it, it doesn't affect anything. It doesn't affect the tr statement of triviality. Okay, so how does this, so I'm, I'm going to just give myself an extra five minutes to just show, to just tell you how this gets used. So if you have this uh, stable trivialization, let's just do it. So given an embedding uh, of T x, y in S n plus k with trivial normal bundle, uh, let's just do d plus k with trivial normal bundle, what you get is this Pontryagin tom collapse map from uh, S D plus K to S K smash with T X Y. Okay? So now we want to, now we're going to use this. Finally, I'm going to use this. And I'm going to use it here. So you can use this to get a map from the from SD plus K smashed with this space of maps I just do it level wise Now, if you are here, you know that the space of flow lines from X to Y acts on this space of maps by this concatenation. So you can just concatenate. Uh, I'm really sorry. These should be Ys. So you can concatenate um, to here, and now we go to X, concatenate, but I want to be careful, I don't want to, I, I know that when I did it here, I concatenated one time, and then I concatenated another time. So if you're doing it at the level of diagrams, the right way to do it is you do concatenate, and you also do some kind of diagonal map. You also keep this factor. You take this, you multiply this one, but you also keep this factor. Okay. So you have a map from here to here. And now if I'm given That's why I don't have to do anything. <clears throat> so if I'm given one of these things, so we can concatenate back. In the other order, To go from here to SK, smash uh, with maps from PY B to PY B. Okay. So that's so one of them was this concatenation here, and the other one is the next concatenation. So altogether, together, 
we get uh, a map that has a, 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 um, uh, I'm sorry, it looks like I did I'm sorry, I, I did something wrong. So this was really supposed to be X. Sorry. X, 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 X. Um, and oh no 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 no. This is why. This is why. Good, everything's fine. Uh, we get a map from uh, not quite what we had before, but we had a map from S um, D plus K smash from P Y B to P Y B. I apologize. I think I know exactly what I did wrong here. You know what I should do? Since I'm already over time, what I will do is next time I will start, uh, I will basically start here. So next, so I just stop. Next time, I will start by explaining this map. I mean, basically, what's happening is that there's too many symbols here. I'm trying to, I'm trying to write, you know, I'm trying to act directly on the space of maps. It's better to just think about just the space of pads themselves. Okay, just look at the space of pads. That has a concatenation. If I have a map, then I can apply it, and then you get you you get the desired expression um, by composing two concatenations with this map here. Okay, sorry. Yes. What is the map here? This one. Okay. So this map, so here I assume that the dimension of T of X, Y is equal to D. Okay. That's the first thing. So that means that the normal bundle has dimension K. So when you take the whole space, you can collapse it. And then when you collapse it, you exactly get this space smash with that. Okay. Anyway, and this diagram here, um, you know, it's, it, I basically just screwed up because what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to think at the level, to just take a path from the base point to Y and then think about how you would act on it. So that's, that's I'll, I'll just do it. It won't take very long. It'll take five minutes next time to just write the correct thing here. Yeah? This was, uh, um, I mean, uh, related to the past, uh, he, he asked the similar question. I mean, that uh, the spectra of uh, S0, which you are writing, uh, S in, I mean, sigma infinity S0, and S0, S1, S2. Yes. So, uh, the, you are saying, saying that is a uh, ring. I mean, uh, what are the elements of the ring? I couldn't understand. I mean, uh, so it's, it's not, that's a problem. So it, it's, it is, as an object in the spectra, it admits a product. So they take, they take the smash product of this thing with itself, it maps back to the sphere. No, but, but if you have a ring, a ring contains is, is a set. So what are the elements of the set? No, it's, so it's, it's, so it's, no, that's what I'm trying to say. It's, um, <clears throat> if you have a category, and that category has a map from it times itself back to itself, then you say an object of a ri is a ring is if, if there is a natural map from R tensor R back to R. So it is not going to be a ring in the sense that there is a set and a product on that set. It's that there is a spectrum, and there's a notion of a smash product of spectra, and there is a map from the smash product of S with S back to S. That's Well, no, this does not assume that it's a, this part does not assume it's a closed manifold. This is for any manifold. It has a sta I mean, it's a completely local statement. I mean, this, this part uses nothing. Um, yeah.